Have you ever wondered how anthill art is made? Or do you just have some pesky fire ants you'd like to carbonize? Welcome back to Adumbrite. Today, I'm going to teach you how to cast an anthill. So here's what we need. We need a propane tank and a roofing torch. We need a lighter. We need a large vice grip, preferably with a uh, space here of about five inches or so. We need a pair of clamps or uh, pliers of some kind. We need a crowbar or some other stirring steel implement, maybe a really long electrical screwdriver. Uh, a one kilogram clay carbon fir um, crucible and a bucket with some concrete in it or a cinder block or something to hold the crucible while you're torching it. So, what do we make the ant L out of? Well, it's easy. Aluminum. It's cheap, it has a low melting point, and it casts pretty well. I'm using aluminum scraps I cut up from cans, a pool motor casing, and some small aluminum girders. I use the roofing torch to melt the aluminum in the crucible. That concrete bucket I've got there insulates the crucible and contains the flames, but you could just as easily do this in a hole or on a flame-proof surface like a concrete slab or garden tile, or even a dirt clearing, although I don't recommend that. As the paint on my scrap burns, it's producing that black ash and smoke. You should try to avoid breathing that in, uh, as that contains polyaromatic hydrocarbons, and these are generally not considered healthy in the long term. It takes between 10 and 15 minutes of continuous heating at a high flow setting of propane to get all the aluminum in the crucible nice and molten. The aluminum should be lightly glowing red and have basically no viscosity. As the aluminum melts, some of it will float to the top in large semi-oxidized chunks, and these are referred to as slag. It's important to remove this slag with some kind of tool. Personally, I use a crowbar. If the slag is not removed, it will fall out of the crucible when you try to pour the aluminum into your anthill, and this could block the hole. If you're using high quality aluminum scrap, like computer heat sinks or actual aluminum ingots, this probably won't be an issue. As a good rule of thumb, it's probably a smart idea to be at least a foot away or a third of a meter away from the aluminum at all times. This is because the molten metal can and will spill or even pop upward due to gas or vapor buildup. Molten aluminum will give you instant second-degree burns if it makes contact, so it's also important to wear closed-toed shoes and long pants, perhaps even face protection if your scrap is of particularly suspicious quality. Heavy leather gloves when handling the crucible are also a good idea. Once enough of the slag has been removed, it's time to secure the vise on the crucible and get ready to pour. Using my heavy pliers to lift the crucible up and out of its concrete nest, I temporarily place it on the driveway, before I then secure the vise tightly around the crucible walls. Once the vise is tightly on my crucible, I can then bring the crucible and vise over to my invasive insectoid foes. Now it's simply a matter of coordination to pour the aluminum down the main entrance of the hive, and to ignore the psychic screaming of the hundreds of perishing ants. I use the excess metal to destroy another nearby hive.
With the massacre complete, I wait for a few minutes before returning with a hose. It's important to keep a hose or some water on hand if you're casting near something flammable, like these dry leaves for instance. Your job is to burn ants, not the whole yard. However, it's not a bright idea to spray molten aluminum with water. You should wait until it's definitely solid, and then approach only with the mist setting. Hot aluminum can be thermally active enough to cause a small steam explosion if you spray it directly, which, if you've never been a part of a steam explosion, I can assure you it is an unpleasant experience. Once I'm sure the metal is solid, I'm ready to start spraying it directly. metal is cooled down enough, you can approach cautiously with an outstretched hand and feel the water around the metal. If it's cool enough to hold your hand in the water for a while, then the metal should be cool enough to remove. You can lightly jostle the metal and remove loose dirt with a spray of water. Once the anthill feels loose enough, you can attempt to pull it right out of there like a turnip from your garden. In this case, we got a beautiful casting of a fire ant nest. Since this nest was still occupied, you can actually still see the black scorch marks where the ants themselves were moments before being carbonized. It's kind of like the casts in Pompeii. Next we move on to the first hive I cast. This one was a little bit more interesting. Not only was it larger, but it also had a few unique architectural features I've never seen in a fire ant mount before. Fire ant hives typically have one shaft going to the surface, but in this hive they've built two shafts for some reason. Maybe these ants got tired of bumping into each other coming and going and decided to have an exit and an entrance. Sadly, I think this innovation probably died with them. Finally, we can take the aluminum castings inside to cut off the excess. If you'd like, you can use a wire wheel or something like that to clean off the surface coloring even more. As for me though, I prefer to keep it more or less the same. So the first thing I do when cutting the excess off is simply put the nest inside of a vice grip. Then I grab my angle grinder with a cutoff wheel, or cutoff disc, and start cutting. The process should only take a minute or two, and the leftover metal can be melted down and used again on the next ant nest. That concludes the video. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed learning how to vaporize your unwelcome neighbors. Until next time.